Good evening, everyone. The next presentation will be in English, but the translation will be available in the online stream, but not in this room. So if you uh, prefer a German version, please go outside and watch the stream. Uh, anyway, it will be at FOMU, an FPGA inside your USB port, and the talk will be given by Tim Mifro Enzel and Sean Xops Cross, and I will introduce himself further. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Tim, and I self identify as a software developer. Um, I'm almost a open source developer. And I'm almost an Australian. Um, I also have a lot of projects. In fact, I give a talk called Tim Has Too Many Projects, and you can find a link to it um, right there. One of my big projects that I've talked about previously at CCC is the HDMI to USB and Tim Videos project. And another one of my big projects is SimbiFlow, which is an open source FPGA toolchain, um, kind of like the GCC for FPGAs. And I'm Sean, and coincidentally, I have too much work. Um, but one interesting fact about me is I tend to get cold easily. So I, I have lots of jackets, because the weather was just up there, and it's going to get pretty cold tonight. Um, uh, so I brought a lot of jackets. Um, fortunately, I live in Singapore, which is on the equator, and so getting cold is not so much a problem. But one other advantage of Singapore is that it's very close to China, certainly closer than Sydney, from where Tin hails. And uh, this is because I like to call myself kind of a fuller stack developer. Um, I like to work on uh, various projects, various hardware projects, low-level hardware projects. Uh, we gave a talk at CCC a couple of years ago about this. This is uh, Project Fernvale, uh, which is an open source uh, MediaTek mobile phone CPU that we open sourced, essentially. The, the hardware and the software is all open. Uh, then there was um, uh, the uh, Chibitronics Love to Code uh, chip that it's kind of like uh, an embedded educational platform for teaching programming to uh, seven or eight-year-olds. It's, it's one step up from learning uh, basic electronics on how to blink an LED. Um, I love the book that we would, did that went along with this. Chapter three is where we introduced multi-threading to them. Um, and then there is uh, the Novena open source laptop, which we actually did a presentation on and did a full crowdfunding campaign. Um, but throughout all of these, I never ran the crowdfunding campaign myself, and I never did any of the hardware myself. Uh, I did a lot of the hardware bring up, a lot of the factory testing, um, but I didn't actually have a project or crowdfunding campaign of my own. I like to describe Sean as my hardware guy. Um, he tends to work with Bunny, who is significantly harder hardware, so he is Bunny's software guy. Um, which I find funny. Um, so as I mentioned, I have a couple of big projects that I've been working on. Um, the HDMI USB and Tim Video stuff, I started in 2011, and who knows when it will be finished? Maybe 2025, if I'm lucky? And that's a long time, and doing really big projects, which take a long time, can be hard. Um, so sometimes I do smaller projects as well, and today I'm going to tell you about the inception of one. And this one actually is literally a smaller project. Um, so my family have computers, and like everyone, um, they deserve to be secure. And my work gave me these things called um, YubiKeys, which help prevent phishing, and I was like, I should get them for my family. Um, and then I noticed something wrong. Um, I love my family, but I don't love them that much, especially since I've got like five computers each being related to me. Um, and that adds up really quickly. And I was frustrated with this because I kind of have a little bit of a hardware bent. I know what's inside this device. It's a little processor. 
it must have literally less than $10 worth of parts in. Um, and it also rubbed me the wrong way that this is a security device that is closed source. So like any hardware geek, I went on DigiKey. I sorted the ARM MCUs by price and came up on this Happy Gecko CPU from Scilabs. It is literally $2.15 USD in individual quantities. Um, so you can imagine how much cheaper it must be in mass quantities. And so knowing this existed, I then created a schematic on a weekend. It was actually pretty fun because it's a, such a simple schematic. I then created the PCB. Um, I did the PCB and schematic in tandem. It was kind of fun. Um, I then put one together by hand, and it worked. Um, I had the device, and you could make it as a hobbyist um, yourself. It's a 6 mil, 6 mil, which is pretty much anything on the planet. Um, and that was really good. And I started giving these to people, and people started wanting them. And the thing is, as I said, I wanted smaller projects. Um, but people kept wanting them and kept asking me to do a crowdfunding campaign for them. And crowdfunding is not a small project. Um, and so um, I'd worked with Sean through a couple of things. And on the off chance he might be silly enough to accept, I sent him an email saying, are you interested in doing this for me? And of course, I said no. Uh, I have too much work. Uh, no, I said yes, actually. So what I had do been doing up to this point, I wanted to do my own crowdfunding campaign. So I came up with this, uh, which was supposed to be a do-it-yourself game controller adapter board. And so you can see it has a whole bunch of inputs. And the idea was uh, you would wire this up together with alligator clips and then wire that to like a joystick box and then plug in a wireless USB dongle into your PC. Uh, and it would be really easy to design it yourself, like maybe a Dance Dance Revolution mat or something like that. Uh, the problem I ran into is that it just didn't make financial sense. Um, overall, I didn't see there would be enough people wanting this to actually turn it into a product. And so I was kind of, um, you know, I was at the prototype stage, but I wasn't sure that this was a project that I could go to production with. Uh, then Tim came to me and said, hey, I have this thing that's at the prototype stage. Uh, what would it take to make Tomu a production-ready board? Uh, and I thought, oh, this seems interesting. People seem to really like Tomu. They seem attracted by the fact that the thing is so simple, uh, yet you can do so much in such a small package. Uh, and there were a few issues with the design at that point, uh, mostly due to the fact that it was a couple of weekend project that Tim put together, uh, and there wasn't really much of a community behind at that point. Um, for example, there was no good bootloader. Like When you have a hardware project, you need a bootloader in order to put new code on it. That's what made Arduino so successful, was they have that serial bootloader that makes it easy to put new code on there. Uh, the one from Scilabs was a, they have a serial-based one that shows up as a serial device. Um, it requires a custom driver. It's open source, but only compiles under the ARM IAR commercial toolchain. Um, and it requires you to short a pin uh, to ground, or to, yeah, to ground um, when turning it on, which is not that doable when it's in your USB port. Uh, so there was a binary patch that was made to turn you know, a, a, a jump if not equal to a jump always, uh, which really, you can't ship a product with that sort of thing. Uh, so what I decided to do was work on a DFU bootloader. Uh, DFU is the device firmware update. Uh, it came out of the OpenMoco, open mobile phone uh, project. It's driverless and simple. It works on all the platforms, uh, even Windows 10, actually, nowadays without a driver. Um, and it only needs endpoint zero. So unlike the serial bootloader, uh, which needs uh, two extra endpoints, two and a half extra endpoints, uh, it works without a whole lot of complicated hardware or software. Um, it needs a plastic case. Um, originally, the design had this image on the left, uh, which was a 3D printed case. It's, it's very simple. You kind of have to put it in the, the USB port at the right angle. Uh, another option was just fold a business card over and jam it in the USB port. Um, it's fine for a hacker, 
but you can't really do a product around it. So I designed the 3D case on the right there uh, and had the factory produce that. Um, this 3D case was actually my introduction into FreeCAD, uh, which is an amazing open source um, 3D modeling program. You all should go use it if you want to do 3D modeling. Uh, one of the cool things, uh, and I'll go into this uh, later, actually I'll go into it now, is that it can export step files. Now step is what the factory is going to want to do, use, and they'll take that step file and turn it into this big piece of steel. That's actually about this big for the, the Tomo. Um, they'll turn it into a chunk of actual steel uh, that requires multiple people, big bars to actually lift up. Um, and it looks like this. This is what it looks like when you actually take a, a slice out of the steel tool. Um, the cool thing is I asked the factory when they produced this tool, hey, can you send me the step files for that tool? Uh, and so I actually stuck those inside the Tomu hardware repository. So if you ever wanted to know what a steel tool looked like that produces a piece of plastic, um, you can see that in these files uh, for the one that we actually used for Tomu. Um, so we launched the campaign, uh, and it was a success. success. Uh, we raised more than enough to cover the cost of the steel tool, to cover the cost of making the bootloader, um, and the great thing is now there are a lot more Tomus. Um, it's now available for mass manufacture. It has a lot of support software and everything that you would need to quickly get started, especially if you're not familiar with how to program a microcontroller. Um, so you don't need to worry about serial bootloaders and have to figure out how to upload something with X modem uh, like the original bootloader had you do. Um, no need to short out pins or fold over business cards. Uh, and we're at a point now where if you want to solder your own from hand, you can too. And you can use our bootloader and our software, and it just makes it easy to get to know hardware from um, a, a more baseline level. Um, things I learned from this, crowdfunding is hard. <laughs> Crowd campaigns are hard. Um, you know, Novena was my first, uh, but this is the first one that I did all by myself. Uh, and I learned that Tomu customers uh, are really awesome. They're really understanding. Um, and, you know, job well done. Uh, you know, that's it. Yay. We're done, right? Right? Well. So, um, as I said at the beginning, I have two primary projects I'm working on at the moment. Um, the second primary project is this project called SimbiFlow, which is an open source FPGA um, toolchain. And I've been looking for ways to get more people into FPGA development. Um, and I came across a cool little FPGA dev board by this guy called Luke Valenti, who goes by the name TinyFPGA. Um, and he created this tiny FPGA board, which was pretty cool. Um, and so I'd already successfully done a smaller project by palming off all the hard stuff to Zobs. Um, so I got thinking, could I do it again? Could I create a FPGA version of the Tomu? Um, at this point, uh, Sean was still busy doing Tomu stuff, and so I contacted Luke and said, you want to give it a go? And he was like, yeah, that seems pretty cool. I'll give that a try. And created this design here. Um, and that was really cool, because um, you can see it's almost exactly the same form factor as the original Tomu, which means that we should be able to reuse the same case. Um, and it's the same size. And it's much smaller than his original tiny FPGA, so it's an even tinier FPGA. And he even constructed one by hand. Um, this is well beyond my skills as a soldering person. Um, but he managed to build one by hand. And so we had a Tomu FPGA device that we knew worked. We could blink an LED with it. Um, and it still fit inside your USB port. So this was really cool. And when looking at the pricing, it looked like it would be cheap enough that I could give them out to people um, without having to worry about their cost. Um, 
The other thing I had found at this point was this thing called CircuitPython by Adafruit. Um, CircuitPython was really cool in that it made people who were previously too scared to be embedded programmers into embedded programmers. Um, and I think that's really cool. So I wanted to s emulate some of that in the FPGA land. Um, so I created yet another project um, called Foopy, which is FPGA MicroPython. Um, CircuitPython is a fork of MicroPython um, to kind of replicate that ease of setup. Um, and to enable people to start their FPGA development um, system by just starting with Python stuff. Um, and we managed to prove out the FPGA MicroPython on some bigger FPGA boards. And everything looked like it was ready. Um, so I asked Luke whether he wanted to run a crowdfunding campaign for this. Um, but turns out Luke is quite a smart person and was like, a crowdfunding campaign is a lot of work. Um, but it turns out I knew this other person who was also really smart, but not actually that smart because he didn't learn the first time. And so I sent him a message and said, do you want to do another one of these? Um, do you want to do another crowdfunding campaign for a device that fits in your USB port? Um, and he grumbled a bit, but it seemed cool enough. Like, if you look at the specs for the FOMU, it's significantly more advanced than what you could do with the TOMU. Um, and so this brings us back to Sean, who actually gets to do all the hard work. Yeah, so earlier, we did a lot with TOMU to get it production ready, because there was a lot that needed to be done to actually get it to a point where we can mass produce it. Um, fortunately, with FOMU, we had a good starting point. We had a plastic case we could work with already. Um, but there was some work that needed to be done. For example, this is the PCB design from the original FOMU that Luke put together. It is very cleverly done. It is doable in essentially a one-layer PCB with relatively lax design rules. Um, but if you zoom in, this is a close-up of the actual FPGA uh, footprint, you can see that some of the pads are round, some of them are flattened and oval. Uh, he does things like uh, running some power wires to some data pins uh, just because he has no way to put a via underneath it to make it not energize that power pin. Um, and so the problem with this is if you actually go and produce this, it will work reasonably well. You'll get some failures right away. Uh, but because as you put it in and out of the USB port, it'll start to flex and slowly come, across, come off and crack. So it might work right away, but eventually over time there might be issues with reliability, um, which is not necessarily what you want to do have with a product. Uh, so I went and redid it a little bit. Um, it's uh, four-layer blind buried vias, uh, which is not such a common process here, in, at least in, in the US. Uh, it's very common in mobile phones, for example. Uh, we, if you, even if you find cheap phones in China, they all use this four-layer blind buried vias just because all of the modern chips require it. Um, because I was going with a, a more advanced process, now I could stick ESD protection down. Um, every component on here has a second source. And that's important from a manufacturing standpoint in that if the crystal that we use is no longer available, we can go with a different supplier and put a different crystal that down, and it should work exactly the same. Um, I was able to run all four wires for SPY, so we can actually do quad SPY on this. Um, the LED has a 3.3 volt power supply going to it rather than a 2.5 volt power supply, because I actually had the room with this four layer design to be able to run the power pins. Um, and I did length match traces, which is not so important on such a small, uh, low, relatively low speed design, but I did it just because. Uh, I put all the test points on the top, um, which ended up not being entirely necessary. Uh, and the thing is, this is 0 0.6 millimeters thick, so we actually have a custom depanelization jig that we put the boards in and then have a CNC drill go through and mill them out. Because if you just bend, so normally when you want to separate PCBs, you either do V-scoring, 
uh, where you essentially run a, a drill across it and then cr bend it in half, uh, or you put mouse bites, they call them, and then you snap it off like that. These weren't really options with, with uh, such a small PCB because the factory was afraid that if they bent it, first off, it'll leave some material on the side, uh, but also it could cause components to flex and, and bounce off. Uh, so we had a custom depanelization jig, uh, which I'll mention in a bit. Um, uh, so the factory management, um, I made a mistake. Uh, hardware is hard. Uh, I screwed up on one of the schematics and accidentally forgot to run power to one of the power rails and accidentally ran ground. So x-rays are really cool. Uh, and I had Bunny, who I work with, and Tim mentioned that he does a lot of hardware. I had him, um, for, for scale, this, this is what a, a, tomu, a FOMU is. Um, so this is that PCB up there. He managed to get a flywire underneath one of these pads, underneath the BGA. Uh, in order to run power to it to make sure that my revised design with the revised schematic would actually work. Um, so the takeaways here are hardware is hard and x-rays are cool. And being in the same time zone as the factory, really handy, because uh, it means it's a much tighter loop actually talking to them. Um, but sometimes things go wrong. Um, this was an example of somebody not knowing how to work a CNC drill. I think they misprogrammed one of the axes or something like that. Uh, it honestly looks like somebody took the erase tool in real life and just tried to erase the, FP, the PCB. Um, this is a sad mistake that, that the factory did. Uh, they only did it once, well, 17 times, but they're never going to do it again, they promise. <laughs> so managing the factory is hard. Um, so Tim mentioned that I was really excited about FOMO. Um, that's because it has this lattice ICE 40 family of FPGA, uh, and it's got a fully open source tool chain. Um, and I mentioned the work that needs to be done. It's got an open source tool chain, uh, but if there's any people here from, the, the, from uh, distro packagers, you know that patching, packaging stuff is hard because this is a list of all the tools you need to run in order to actually produce a working bitstream. If you have an embedded CPU, you just need a compiler. Uh, for this, we use GCC. Risk Five has a has a uh, or sorry, Sci Five has a tool chain they put out. So we just use that tool chain from them. Uh, then you need a synthesizer. Yosis is the one we use. Uh, but there, it was difficult to find pre-compiled versions of Yosis that were current for platforms like Windows and Mac. Uh, the same story for the Playson route. We use Next PNR, uh, which is brand new. Uh, it's only what about a year old. I think a little bit longer than that. A little bit longer than that. But it's not available in any of the common packaging systems, and certainly not available for Windows or Mac. Uh, for packing, we use Project Ice Storm, and that takes the output from the placing route and turns it into a bitstream. Um, there's no pre-compiled binaries available from the vendors uh, for that for any of the platforms. Uh, we use DFU utils for loading DFU. Now, that does exist for Windows and uh, Mac, but installing it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, especially if you aren't familiar with Homebrew. Um, and for interaction, we have Wishbone Tool, which is a tool that I wrote, and we'll talk about that at a workshop that we're giving later. Um, so we had to package all of this, um, and you could see, finally, after a lot of work on the image there on the, on the right, uh, finally, Travis is reporting that everything passes, so yay. Uh, the installation process there is you download it and you set the path. Um, that was a thing we had to do. Um, by we, we mean Sean. I yeah. just looked at it. <laughs> um, for, we, we also needed a copy of Python. Uh, now, Python is great because you can get it just about anywhere. Uh, and we use this software called MeGen. MyGen? MeGen? Uh, I'm never sure how to pronounce it. It's, it's weird living on the internet because you see these words all the time and you never actually pronounce them. I say MeGen. Um, it outputs Verilog as part of its output stream, which is great because you could take that code and then inspect it in case you're not sure what it's doing, or run that into a, si uh, a, a simulator, such as Icarus Verilog or, or something along those lines. Uh, it has native finite state machine support, multiple clock domains. Um, there's none of this distinction that you get in um, uh, Verilog of like register or wire. Uh, and it's actually real Python code that compiles certain things down into synthesizable Verilog code. That's an example of what a finite state machine looks like. 
somewhat difficult to do in Verilog, uh, super easy to do in MeGen. Um, we also use this CPU called VexRisk V. VexRisk V? Five. Five. five, okay. Um, so the nice thing about Risk Five is that you have several designs to choose from. We use Vex uh, because it has a lot more features. There's Pico RV, there's Minerva. Um, the great thing about Risk Five is that the compilers are all upstream. You can go and get Clang. I believe they're getting support for Risk Five. Um, Sci Five packages GCC. Uh, it's so easy to just change which compiler you're using, and suddenly you're targeting a, a whole new platform. Um, VEX also has on-chip debugger support, so they have this debug port uh, that it's designed to be used in Verilator and simulation, but we take advantage of that in a different way. Um, and one advantage of RISC-V versus some other CPUs that we used to use, such as LM32, is that um, the code size is more compact. So if you're limited in the amount of ROM you have, Switch to Risk Five, and you should save. I think it was about 30% of code size, um, just by changing your compiler and your CPU. Um, but compilers are still not as good as ARM right now. They'll get there, and if you look at some of the synthetic uh, handcrafted assembly code, it seems like they'll get there eventually. Uh, which brings us to the magic of um, FOMO: is that you can just treat it as a Risk Five as a user. You don't even have to care that it's a CPU, that, it, that it's an FPGA. When you get it, it's running software. So there's no need to replace the bitstream and do all this FPGA stuff. Just treat it like a CPU, one with 128K of RAM and a 2 megabytes of storage. Uh, you can use GCC, which you're familiar with, presumably. Uh, you can write bare metal C if you want. Uh, there's a port of Zephyr that's currently uh, is it going upstream, or is it getting upstream? Um, the base support is upstream, um, and a bunch of the peripherals are upstream as well. I think the USB is missing still, though. And you can treat it as uh, just a DFU device to load devices, or in the future, we'd like something with UF2, uh, or just treating it like a normal mass storage device to drag your binary onto the disk and have it just work. And that's something that the CircuitPython people do, is that they just appear as a mass storage device, and you drop your file onto the um, system, and you can program it that way. You don't need any software or anything apart from the ability to mount a mass storage device. Right. Having it just show up as a USB mass storage hard drive is a huge enabler to getting people over the hump of just getting started, because it's something friendly that they know. Um, on top of that, uh, Tim is very good at convincing people to do things for him, and he found this project called Renode, uh, which is kind of like QMU on steroids. Uh, it is something I have yet to try, but it supports a whole bunch of SOCs, and he's, uh, it's, it's great for, for you know, debugging and continuous integration, and it's designed to not just simulate the CPU, but to simulate everything around the CPU as well. Um, and so it's to manage to get them to add uh, LightX support upstream, uh, FOMU support. So it simulates the VEX risk V. Uh, it simulates many of the LightX peripherals, such as the, the timer, the interrupt handler. Uh, they're working on doing simulation of the USB stack, which is going to make debugging the, the, the software a lot easier. Uh, so you can actually synthesize or compile FOMU software and run it in uh, Renode. And in fact, the upstream Renode config now ships with uh, FOMU as one of its configuration settings. Um, now I mentioned the USB stuff. Uh, to borrow a quote from Carl Sagan, uh, when first you're inventing writing the bootloader, uh, you first have to invent the universe. Uh, so with Tomu, we just had to write the DFU aspect of it. Uh, but with FOMU, we had to do it all from scratch. Uh, we had to create the USB itself. Um, uh, so we, there was some sample code originally from Luke, uh, who got it working within a single 48 megahertz clock domain. Um, but uh, I, there was a lot of work I had to do to get the bootloader working on FOMU. Um, 
uh, we ended up with this thing called Valenti USB. Uh, it's written entirely in Python and MeGen. Uh, it has a few different CPU interfaces available. Uh, one is one that actually shows up as the CPU. Uh, I'll go over some of the other ones later. Um, one of the interesting design decisions we had to make is the UP5K is small. Like most of the time, you think of an FPGA, you think big, outputs a lot of heat. Uh, when I plug this into my USB battery pack, it keeps turning off because it thinks nothing's plugged in. Um, as a result, it doesn't meet timing with everything in the 48 megahertz domain, so we had to slow it down. We had to pull as much USB stuff into this slower 12 megahertz domain to get it to meet timing. Um, and Unlike most of the other ICE-40 boards out there, with the exception of the tiny FPGA, we have no native UART. So a lot of the ICE-40 things talk directly to an FTDI. We don't have a native FTDI, so there's no way to talk to this native. We don't have a native anything support. We have to create it all from scratch, um, which leads to some pretty interesting things we could do. Um, if you look at this, this is a schematic of what a LightX chip looks like. You can see there's a wishbone bus at the top, and that brings everything together. It brings together the CPU, uh, the configuration status registers, like serial, uh, timer, uh, IRQs. Uh, the RAM is on the wishbone bus. The ROM is on the wishbone bus. Um, but you'll notice that on this, there's also this thing called a bridge that we can add, which LightX supports this interesting thing called multi-mastering, where we can actually have two or more masters on the wishbone bus. Uh, and you know, I saw this, and I thought, ah, I wonder if we could make a bridge out of that, out of the USB. Um, so I put the slide in there because there was a talk given by CERN about light, about Etherbone, uh, which is a protocol to tunnel wishbone over Ethernet. And the only source I found for the actual protocol definition was a talk. So in keeping with the tradition of that, here is my slide describing debugging over USB. Uh, it's really simple. It's two separate commands. One is read, one is write, and it's a setup packet. And if you do it right, the actual RISC-V running on FOMU has no idea this is going on. This is completely separate from that it doesn't know that there's a debug command. But through this, we can um, read and write anywhere within this wishbone bus. Um, now remember earlier I said that the VEX has a debug port? Well, it turns out that is on the wishbone bus as well. So we can do really cool things like run GDB over the USB bus to debug the CPU that's running inside your USB port over the USB in the USB port running on the FPGA. So it's kind of wow, this is really cool, and this works. And this is an example uh, that we're going to talk about from the workshop where we're actually debugging a blink code. You can see the backtrace. You can stop. You can set breakpoints. Um, uh, you can take it one step further and actually debug the USB code over USB if you break in the right points, uh, which is kind of a fun trick because we don't have enough space in there for a serial console uh, anymore because it's full of USB. But we can get full online debugger support. Uh, and uh, the Reno team is also, like I said, in the process of adding uh, USB emulation. Uh, so now they can actually use Valenti USB as a target. Um, one step further, uh, when you have a serial port on your FPGA board, you can send serial data back and forth and get information that way. Um, but we can actually take this design one step further and actually cut out the CPU entirely. We don't even need a CPU in our design because we have this bridge and we can access all of Wishbone. And with LightX, you can actually do really cool things like this, where this is essentially what a GPIO block looks like. There's you know, really nothing more to it than this. Uh, it defines a storage register, um, and then it gets some pads that get passed into it, and then it assigns this, the backing from uh, the output from the storage register into the pads. Uh, and that's it. That's, that's really all there is to get this working. Uh, and if you plug this in, it will generate a file called csr.csv, which will give you memory addresses, which you can then peek and poke over the USB bus. Um, and it's, it's super easy to get started and super understandable in how it all works. Um, 
again, going one step further, Renode supports the FOMU bridge. So you can actually run a virtual CPU on your PC and communicate to FOMU via this bridge. So remember how I said we removed the CPU earlier? You can kind of put it back by running it on your PC and then just memory map everything from Wishbone over to the bus. Uh, and so here's an example of what it looks like when you run something on your PC. Uh, they're running, uh, you can see the communications running on the side, and they're actually blinking an LED by poking memory into a virtual CPU on the PC that gets routed over this bus's memory rights over USB. Um, so, I mean, that's just, that, that's really cool. Um, so to wrap it all up, running a crowd campaign is hard. <laughs> Videos are hard. Uh, Novino was my first. Uh, Tomu was my first by, by myself. Um, but I can say that through it all, Tomu and FOMU customers are all awesome. So thank you. Back to Tim. So what we've shown is the Tomu and the FOMU. Um, and I've been fairly successful in convincing people to do this work. I haven't actually done much apart from management and poke people. Um, Sean here has done a lot of the work of making this stuff happen. Um, and so we have the Tomu family. Um, and so why stop there? Um, maybe there are other um, people on the internet that might want to do it. So we have the Tomu. Um, the key thing about the Tomu is you can build it yourself. Um, then we have the Fomu, which is configurable hardware. Um, there's this other group on the internet who make this thing called the Solo Key, and they were interested in doing something similar. And so we talked to them, and they developed the Somu which is the security Tomu. It's very similar to the original Tomu, except it uses a uh, STM secure microprocessor. So you can have more confidence that you could use this as a security key. Um, and they have UF2 support, including FIDO2 um, support. So that's the Tomu. Um, None of our systems had any way to communicate with the outside world. And I noticed this guy called um, Femto that made these really cool tiny beacons. And so I suggested he make a ESP32 Tomu. And crazy enough, he did. Um, there's a design that exists and is working on it. He calls it the Femu. I prefer to call it the Womu, personally, for wireless Tomu. Um, but it's his project, so he gets to name it. Um, and so we've got a bunch of Tomu projects out there. Um, but what about a Bluetooth, a BOMU? Um, there's this great little chip called the, NF, the NRF52840. Uh, um, that would make an awesome security key with NFC and Bluetooth. Um, and we even have a logo already to go for that. Um, when I did the logos, um, or when I convinced somebody else to do the logos for me, um, I suggested they do a Bluetooth version. Um, and what about something else I haven't thought about? Um, there's plenty of cool people in the audience that might have ideas. So you can reuse a lot of the stuff we've designed. If you reuse the form factor, you can use the cases Sean has designed. Um, so I would encourage you to try and build some stuff that fits inside your USB port. I think it's really cool. Um, and I've been known to help fund these projects and help develop these projects because while I don't have a lot of time myself, um, I have a IT salary and very little expenses, and I love to see people doing open hardware. Um, so I would love to see you make more Tomu-related family things. Um, and so we did the Tomu and the uh, Fomu, but there is more of it, more of the family. We would love to see even more and even more. So 
At CCC Camp, we will be running workshops. And when I say we, I mean Sean will be running workshops, um, because he hasn't learned yet. Um, the workshops will be at the Hardware Hacking Village. Um, the thing is, if you come to me and show that you have the FOMU toolchain set up, I will give you a free FOMU to play with. And it's yours to keep. Um, that's the great thing about the FOMU project, is it's cheap enough, I can do that. Um, the other thing is if you do more than that, if you send me pull requests, I'll give you even more hardware. Um, I also have non-Tomu FPGA hardware here um, that I'd love to not take back home. Um, this hardware is a little bit more expensive. Um, if you're interested in working on SimbiFlow or one of these other um, FPGA boards, I have them here to give you. Um, if you send me pull requests, um, I will give you hardware. That's kind of my deal. Um, and so I'd love for you to come and contribute to SimbiFlow. Um, I think FPGAs are really interesting technology. Thanks to a huge amount of work that Sean has done, we actually have a device that I can give out that is cheap enough that will get you into FPGA development or RISC-V development if you don't want to go into FPGA development, um, or just embedded Python development if you don't want to go into RISC-V development. Um, and I think this builds a really interesting pathway that previously hasn't been available. And I'd really like to thank all the people who I've collaborated with, um, including Sean, who's been a major person in making this possible, um, but including others like Luke, who did the um, original Tomu design, Florent, who does a lot of the Litex code, um, the White Quark and Sebastian, who do MeGen and NMeGen, um, the Reno team for the Reno support. Um, I think one of the really important things and the, one of the things I've really loved about the Tomu project is the fact that it's a family of people coming together to do cool things. And everybody has different reasons for doing it. Um, my reason is because I want to see cool things exist. Um, and it really makes me happy to see them happen. So um, hopefully this talk has enthused you that um, if you stand near me long enough, you'll find yourself doing a project for me. Um, and that will be an awesome experience, and you'll get to learn lots. Um, so, yeah, um, I have a bag of FOMUs here. Um, this is about 200. The one thing that's a little bit disappointing about FOMUs is that you get like a pack of 1,000. It's only like this big and this high. Um, so, um, yeah, and I still have plenty more that aren't in this bag. Um, so I feel like I'm very unlikely to run out, but running out would be a good thing. I will make more, or more I will get Sean to make more and buy them off him. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>